But in case of a nanny, if there is nobody around them, how will he live? How will he sustain that was his point? So Maharaj says, when the beingness was in that womb, the body formation took place spontaneously, is it not? Similarly, in case of a nanny, since he is one with the manifest nature, he is the nature itself. So it is the worry of the nature to look after him. No pathology is as such a required. Everything will happen around you.
I ask if some people want to prolong their life, then they want to prolong their life, it means that they have the self-love. So does it mean that they are within the limits of the Maya, the illusion? Maharaj, have they transcended? Maharaj says that once they have transcended the I am the body idea, then it doesn't matter whether they live short or long. So, for example, if you have a good idea, then you have a good idea. For your existence, you don't depend on anything. Without depending on anything, you try to find out yourself what you are. It is pointing to you, Mr. Paul, and you are facing the power. Manya Pajapi, other Rekta, Yamra Pajapi, and so on. हाँ अब काय में मैं जा जा मुझे आ जा भाई इसे इसे और या जब तक अच्छे से ना ना हुआ था हाँ हाँ सब व्यवहार इसे और ना हुआ जाना हो तो अलग लगा इसे और ना हुआ तो यार आ जाओ लो अपना भी जाना अपन कम क्यों है मुझे लाइक कर दो लाइक कर दो आपका विचार तो कौन है आपने? आपका विचार रोज नहीं। मुझे क्या नहीं रोज जाता हूँ? He says whenever you want to think or ponder over, you ponder over something which you are not. Something other than it. Other. You think on something else, not you. Then how to think on yourself? You cannot think. You become thought free. You, whenever you want to think, you think on something else which is not you. Even you may say, bring a very noble thought like Ishwara. Ishwara is a word apart from you and you want to think over that. But can you think on your own self? That is the question. Remember it also. No attention state. 
With being a later attention starts. And the analysis of Nana Gilrath, Matva Tomu Maya Tomu. So now he says, Yala Apan Azlati Tak Miriam Nai. Matva Tomu Maya Rumi Marwa. That borderline of beingness and no being. That being. That being and no being. Just at that point, it is normally said, in Murmaya, Hiran Nagarva. Some glorious names are given. Because being and no being, that bottom is there. There is no attention also. And the attention thing is there. In Rukhman Pujara, Elena Pujara, so now why is that?
वॉकिंग भी बैठ करना इज अ मूवमेंट एक्टिविटी
પરમપ્રમા કર્મા બોલે જાણ્યો જ ઉતરલાય એ જાણી જે આજી એ પરમપ્રમા લાગે છે કર્મા બોલે કરી શકે બરોબર મારો કર્મ કરે ત્યારે નો કર્મા ઇન ધ સ્ટેટ ઓફ પરમપ્રમન વેર ધ પ્રજા કર્મ દેહમાં નાનો દેખાય વિશે કાં કરાય ભાઈ હોતા ગુલ કરાય હુ હેઝ એન્ટર હુ હેઝ એન્ટર ધ બોડી માઇન્ડ ફોર્મ હુ આ બોલી મને આ કાઢવા મેં બોલે ચલાય કે નહીં કાં કરવા વિશે બધા કરવા ઇન ધ રૂ ઇન ધીસ રૂમ ધ સ્પેસ હેઝ એન્ટર ઇન ધીસ રૂમ ધ સ્પેસ ઇઝ ધેર Why the space has entered into this room? Yeah. Why the space has entered into this room? Why? No and how? And how? Why and how space has entered into this room? All you can teach is understanding. The rest comes on its own. This is almost a mantra that Maharaj used. Because there really was no practice. Maharaj kept on giving you information, if you will, that would dispel or discard or confront you with the information you already had. For example, if he would say to you, hold on to the I am and let go of everything else, which is kind of his standard teaching. That means that anything with that would come up. It doesn't matter. I love myself. I hate myself. I'm glad I'm here. I love God. I hate God. I want to serve. I don't want to serve. No matter what came up, it didn't really matter. That was all to be discarded. It's all a concept. It's all an illusion. So all you can do, all he would do, is give you the, in quotes, understanding. And the rest would come on its own as everything fell away as not this, not this. We're going to take this in chunks, and then what I want to do is to do it as uh, emotional states, because emotional states are very charged states for people, particularly in the world of the New Age spirituality, where anger is bad and love is good, right? And fear is bad somehow, and forgiveness is somehow spiritual. Okay. So you have a very much dichotomy. The linguistically, all language is, comes in what's called binaries, where the first term It is considered higher or closer to God, is a great illusion, than the second term. So love is better than hate. Compassion is better or higher than passion, we'll say. Right. Courage, probably, is better than fear. Okay. That's a linguistic process. One state is considered higher or closer to God or the source than anything else. 
So we want to try to deconstruct that using tantric yoga. Okay. So in this process, you have the nothing and you have it condenses down and abstracts, 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 and all of a sudden I am. There's a, a feeling of sensations in the body. There's sensations in the body. Sensations are prior to thought. Sensations in the body, and sensations then condense further and form a thing called I am. Then you learn that certain sensations mean anger. In other words, if my body gets, I guess, hot or red or whatever, I call that anger. We're taught as children anger is bad, another concept. And we're taught in therapy we should get rid of our anger or express our anger in some way, in some form of therapy. Another abstraction, another concept, another idea. Okay. So in tantric yoga, the basic statement is, if at the moment of extreme anger or extreme sadness, or extreme fear, or you are running for your life, if at that moment you could become introverted, you would experience spanda. Spanda is defined as divine throb, the divine pulsation. Okay. The text is called the spanda karakas. Spanda means the pulsation or throb. Karakas means lessons. So it's lessons in the divine pulsation. Okay. Now, the question is, for sexual one, it would look like if at the moment of orgasm, you could become introverted, and I'll really go over what introverted means, you would experience sponda. They left out one little piece here. If at the moment of orgasm, you could remember to become introverted, <laughs> then you would experience sponda. Okay. So we're going to do this in chunks. We're going to start off with anger, and we'll work our way all the way through sexuality, and then we'll take questions and so on as we go along. Okay. So what I'd like you to do is to let your eyes close. And what I'd like you to do is to recall a time where you felt angry. And focus your attention on the story as to why you feel what you feel. And as you focus your attention on the story as to why you feel what you feel, Notice where in your body you feel the anger. Do you feel the anger in your chest or your throat or your hands? Just kind of scan your body. Now what I'm going to ask you to do is to take your attention off of the story as to why you feel what you feel and focus your attention on the anger itself. Notice the size and shape of the anger. Step into the anger and be the anger. Step out of it and witness it. Step into it and be it, as much as you can be it. Step out of it and witness it. Take the label 
off of the emotion called anger, take the label off it, and experience it as just consciousness or energy in a different shape or form. Don't try to change it. Just let it do whatever it does. So, let's do another piece. And each time I'll add like a little piece to it. So, let your eyes close again. And recall a time you felt sad. Focus your attention on the story as to why you feel sad. And as you continue to focus on the story as to why you might have felt sad, notice where in your body you feel sad. Do you feel sad in your eyes and throat? chest, wherever it might be. Notice the size and shape of the sadness. In other words, where it is and where it isn't and step into it and be the sadness. Step out of it and unbe it. Step into it and be it. Step out of it and just witness it. Take the label off of the story as to why you felt sad end the sadness simultaneously. And just experience it as energy or consciousness, whichever. And allow it to do whatever it does. You just witness it. So what keeps us locked into an emotional state is the story you have about it. So you have sensations, which become the story. And then, so let's say, for example, I'm in a relationship and the relationship's not working, and I go over to somebody and I say, I don't tell them usually I feel sad. I might say I feel sad. Mostly I'm focusing on the story as to why I feel what I feel. I don't usually turn my attention the other way and focus on the experience itself as energy or consciousness. So I focus on the story, and then I go to person one, and I tell them the story, and I go, well, wasn't she an asshole? And they go, yeah, you're right. And I go to person two, and they go, and obviously she was an asshole. And then person number three, and they go, oh, is she an asshole? And they go, I don't think so. And they go, oh, well, obviously you're not together. And then I go to person four. So I'm looking for someone to agree that they, my story, that, I, that, that my nervous system has automatically come up with. We have learned 
that. That is an almost automatic response. There are neural pathways that this will bring you to that each time. So let me do another one. So he has fear. How about fear? Probably in the top ten. Okay. So recall a time where you felt incredibly afraid. And as you focus on the story as to why you feel afraid, you notice where in your body you feel the fear. Do you feel it in your chest, your jaw, your stomach, wherever that be? Once again, notice the size and shape of that experience called, labeled fear. Step into it and be it. Step out of it and witness it. Step into it and be it. Step out of it and witness it. Take the label off of the story and the feeling called fear. Take the label off of both of them simultaneously and have them both as made of energy or consciousness and then allow it to do whatever it is it does. If any thoughts come into your awareness, take the label off of them and just have them as made of the same energy or consciousness. Notice your skin boundaries. Take your, the label off of the skin boundaries and have it as slow moving energy or consciousness, made of the same consciousness. Again, if any thoughts or anything comes up, just take the label off, have it as it is, as energy or consciousness. Different shape, different form. Skin boundaries, slow moving energy or consciousness. Notice even the breathing mechanism, if you take the label off, it's just energy or consciousness.
So in a moment, I'm going to ask you to open your eyes and come back to the room. Keeping part of your awareness in your body impression is energy or consciousness. And when you open your eyes and come back here, part of your awareness will be out here. So, let me do another one. And I would like you to have a sexual fantasy. It shouldn't be too difficult. And allow that sexual fantasy to really develop. And notice where in your body you feel sexual. Do you feel sexual in your mouth? Do you feel sexual in your genitals? Just notice where in your body you feel sexual. Noticing the size and shape, step into and be those sexual sensations. Actually feel them and be them. Step out of them and witness them. Step into it and be it. Step out of it and witness it. Take the label off of the story as to why you feel sexual and the sexual sensations. Take the label off of both of them simultaneously and have them both as made of the same energy or consciousness. any thoughts or fantasies come up, just take the label off them and have them as energy. Notice your skin boundary. Take the label off the skin boundary and have it as slow-moving 
or condensed or solidified with slow moving energy or consciousness. Take the label off of the chair, the floor, the air. And all the people around you. And experience them as and it as all made of the same consciousness. The chair, the walls, the people, all the people, everyone all made of the same consciousness, same energy. We'll do one last one. So let your eyes close again. And again, each time I'm adding one little piece. And recall a time you felt incredible joy, happiness. Notice where in your body you feel the joy. Feel it in your heart, face, wherever it be. Notice the size and shape. Step into it. Step out of it. Step into it and be it. Step out of it and witness it. Take the label off of the story as to why you feel what you feel, the joy, and the feelings of joy itself. And have them both made of the same energy or consciousness and allow it to do whatever it does. Again, take the label off of your skin boundary and have it as condensed or slow moving or compacted into your consciousness. The same consciousness as the thoughts or the sensations. Again, take the label off of the chair, floor, people, the air. All made of the same energy or consciousness. The air would be thinned out or less dense energy and the floor would be more condensed energy.
Allow an image to come to you of someone that you hate or dislike. Take the label off of them and have them as energy or consciousness. Allow an image to come up someone that you love. Take the label off of it and have it as energy or consciousness. Yeah, make sure to take the label off of your skin boundaries, the air, the chair, the walls, the, everybody in the room. And now finally, notice the awareer or the witness, the one that's been taking all the labels off. And allow that, that's been all doing all the delabeling, allow that to be made of the same consciousness as everything else. Any thoughts, anything comes through, just take the label off. And then have the awareer or the witness that is made of the same consciousness as that which it's witnessing. Just a different form of it. So in a moment, I'm going to ask you to open your eyes. And when you do, besides having everything as just consciousness, notice that the one who is seeing, the seer, and what it sees are both made of the same consciousness, the same energy. In the mid-1970s, I had opened up a psychotherapy practice in Southern California. And I was invited to, do a, to participate as a, as a person, as a participant in a workshop with Ram Dass, actually in Santa Cruz, California. And so I went to a classic seven-day retreat with Ram Dass. And during that time, I only had really one thing that kept on coming up to me very, very clearly. And that was that I wanted to get rolfed. And the reason I wanted to get rolfed was my body had hurt so much from meditating for so many hours that I needed to get my body worked on. And so I went back to Los Angeles and I was in a training program. And in the training program with Jack Rosenberg, I asked him for a rolfer, somebody who I could work with, someone I could be comfortable with, someone that would really fit for me. 
and Jack recommended a man by the name of Chet Wilson. Unknowing to me, Chet Wilson worked in a Muktananda Meditation Center in Southern California, in Santa Monica. So when I got to the Meditation Center, I obviously had a great connection with Chet, and I began to get Rolf once a week, and then over time I was getting what they would call Reiki therapy, very traditional Reiki therapy once a week. So on Tuesday I'd get Rolf, Thursday I'd get Reiki work. One day, during a Reiki session, a breathing session, all of a sudden my breath stopped, and I had this incredible image of Bhagwan Nityananda. Abhut Nityananda died in 1961. He's kind of a very famous saint in India. I had never heard of him. I had no concept of guru or not guru or teacher or that kind of stuff, even though I had meditated for years. And when I came out of this state, all of a sudden, Abhut Nityananda was my guru. And I didn't really know what that meant. My body was actually permeated with his energy, with his shakti. Within about six months, I met Muktananda who was in New York at the time, and then he had told me, why not come to India? Shortly after I got there, someone had given me a copy of the book, I Am That. And I read the book, and I was completely blown away. It was like everything in that, in that work, every word in that book, kind of mesmerized me, to say the least. And so I knew, I was in about three hours, I was living in the, what within was like a jungle, maybe about three hours from Bombay, where Nisargadatta was. And in 1977, I just went there in a very flippant manner with, with my wife at the time. And we kind of knocked at the door in the middle of the afternoon. We asked from where Maharaj was. And the woman said, come back, you know, in the morning or in the evening, which I did not do. In 1979, two years more had passed. And I'm still in India doing my yoga practice. And I'm up at 3 o'clock in the morning. And I'm meditating and doing a t- typical, very traditional yoga thing. And... I decided to go see Nisargadatta. It was 1979 on my birthday. So when I got there, normally in the past when you saw gurus, there's like this energy, and that energy is emanating from a point in space-time. But what struck me was when I got to Maharaja's place, and he was a little slum outside of Bombay, and he lived in an attic. He had built this attic, maybe about 10 by 10, and, and you'd climb up a, a ladder, really. It was almost a level ladder and into this, like, attic. And I'm walking around. There were about ten people up there in a room, ten by ten. And I can't really find Maharaj because I don't know what even what he looks like. And I'm trying to figure out who is this guy in the Maharaj. And I'm looking at all these big pictures on the wall and behind there's a picture of Ramana Maharshi and so on. And I finally I get that this is Nisargadatta in front of me. And there's an arati going on, a chant going on at the time. And I turn around, and at the time in my life, I was really suffering terribly. I'd done this yoga practice for a year. I'd been a client in psychotherapy for years. I had traveled all the way to India, given up my wife, given up my entire life. And now here I am in India, and I'm suffering terribly. And I turn around, and I see a picture of Ramana Maharshi. And from some space really deep down inside me, not even my voice, this voice kind of looks at this picture of Ramana Maharshi and says, will you just please show me who I am? And I turn around, and Maharaj is looking right at me. And we make eye contact for what seemed like an hour. It was probably a matter of about 30 seconds. And right after the chanting... You would go up to him, and I went up to him, and he said to me, how long have you been in India? And I think I said about two years. And he looked at me and he said, are you willing to stay eight days and absorb the teachings? And at the time, the context of guru, disciple, and spirituality, and all the programming I had received, although I didn't know it was programming, was... Whatever the guru wants you to do, you do. And if you do what he tells you to do, then you get liberated and enlightened and all these types of things. I was very programmed, like everybody else, certainly in the 70s. And so Maharaj says, are you willing to just stay eight days and absorb the teachings? And I give him the perfect answer of a spiritual seeker, a sadhak, a sadhu at that time, which is, whatever Maharaj wants me to do, I'll do. And he looked at me with this disgust. He looked at me like almost with disdain. 
And he said, don't you understand? I don't play that game. If you want to play guru disciple, you play it someplace else. If you want to stay, stay. If you don't want to stay, go. Now, at the time, I had a little thing in the back of my consciousness somewhere that knew that spirituality and the, and the game, the, the, the behavior that people take on around gurus and, and yoga and so on, I knew it was a game. I knew it was an act. But everywhere I went, everybody reinforced the act. They didn't break the act. They didn't end the act. Maharajan went immediately, boom, right for the act. So the way it was set up there, as I went downstairs, and there was like a tea shop downstairs, and some of his uh, students came down, and they said, oh, my, they were all excited. My God, Maharaj told you to stay eight days and absorb the teachings, and so on and so on and so on. And so I get back upstairs after the tea, and normally he would do like a talk for anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour, and then he would take questions and answers, depending upon, as time went on, as he got older, obviously, he spoke less and answered questions less, too. Anyway, I walk upstairs, and he immediately starts yelling at me, and just sit in the corner over there, and you come in here, and you're making all this noise, and so on and so on. But I, it didn't phase me at that point at all. And he was giving a talk about the beingness. And the being, what is the beingness? And the beingness comes from food. And what is the essence of food? The essence of food is seminal fluid. And he said, and they asked me who my successor is going to be. I'm going to tell you who my successor is going to be. My successor is going to come from my seminal fluid. And what's seminal fluid? Seminal fluid is the essence of food. And what's the essence of food? If it's the essence of food, seminal fluid is food. And the food comes from the body. And so you're all a bunch of semen. What do you have to be proud about? And then he looks at me. And at the time, I had spent several years in India with Muktananda and, of course, time in the United States with Muktananda. And he looked at me and he said, great sages like Muktananda, they're only into accumulating wealth. And I kind of, I freaked out. I felt like my body was on fire because here I was, spent all this time, I'd given up my wife, my life, everything, and all, and I had followed this thing that I was told to do by Muktananda. And all of a sudden, and I always knew that it was a game. And I always knew there was something not right about it. But being in the context of an ashram in the middle of India, you constantly are being uh, tranced out. Everybody is constantly always telling you, you know, do this and the spiritual and you should only do it the guru. Whatever the guru tells you, do you do and so on. And if anybody speaks bad about the guru, you should stay away from them. But you, I always knew it was bullshit. But the problem was that no one was able to no one was able to get me out of the bullshit. When Maharaj said that, is I looked at him and I knew one hundred percent sure that I had met somebody that number one would never lie to me and number one didn't care. He didn't care whether I liked him or didn't like him, whether I came back, whether I didn't come back, whether I had money, whether I didn't have money. One of the most powerful experiences I had with Maharaj is I was living about three hours away and it was his last birthday celebration. Now, I knew his, that it, what his birthday was and so I went to his house and arrived there about 8 or 8.30 in the morning and when I got there, I tried to open the doors to get into his house and I couldn't get in. But inside... I heard about six or eight or ten people chanting. And and I was trying to get in, and I couldn't get in, and there's this chanting going on, and all of a sudden, the doors open, and these only Indians, only Maharaja's family was there, and a couple of, of uh, Indian devotees. And it looked as though they were chanting into a closet. And I didn't quite know what was going on. All of a sudden... The several people parted, and I looked into this closet, but it wasn't a closet. It was the shower room, and in India, there's a little spigot and a bucket, 
and you shower like this. And one of the Indians came up to me and said, would you like to pour water? Now, I knew what that meant because in India they had a ceremony called Abhishek. And in Abhishek, generally, you wash the statue of a saint and then the water actually is considered like prasad or blessed, blessed, if you will. And so the, these people part and in this water closet in front of me is Maharaj sitting on a stool just with a dhoti on and he's just sitting there like this and eating him. So they offered me the opportunity so of course I said yes. So I went towards him and I took some water from down below and I just kind of ran it very, very gently across his leg. And all of a sudden, I went into an open night samadhi. I had no idea. And I just stood there almost like a statue, frozen. Maharaj used to communicate many things to me just with a smooth of his hand. And I was not even aware of what was going on. And he went like this. And I instantly knew what he meant. He kind of broke my field of vision and I kind of came out of that samadhi. And he wanted me to take the glass and to put the glass up above because if it had fallen, there's no, it just would have shattered all over the place in the middle of a little shower room. It would have been a big disaster. So I put the glass here and I kind of floated back and then I just burst into tears. So Maharaj, even at the time, I didn't realize what our interactions meant or what impact it would have in my life. And certainly the creation of quantum psychology and all the things that followed after that, I saw what was a derivative of Maharaj's work. And everything that he taught me and everything that was said and I am that. He used to say, what I'm planting in you is seeds and one day those seeds will sprout. And the words of a realized man can never go to waste. Sometimes it will take a long time for them to sprout, but they have to sprout and they will sprout. 